everyone and welcome to our November wrap up of the distance learning playbook study. This past month, we spent some time learning about ways that we can increase student engagement in the distance learning setting, as well as how we can design experiences that impact students understanding, as well as some strategies we can use to support those experiences. For this video, we have two success criteria. The first is that you can make connections from what you read this past month or what you heard in our synchronous meeting to our provided highlights. And then two, that you can explain the expectations for completing the last month's topic in Google Classroom. So let's start with that first success criterion that you can make connections from what you read to our highlights from module six and module seven. Module six was all about engaging task, and we know that in the distance learning setting, even more so than face to face, we have to consider student motivation. We know that that is a factor, so when we design tasks, we have to keep elements in mind that will increase their engagement and their motivation to complete those tasks. So module six starts out talking about the three levels of engagement. We have behavioral, cognitive, and emotional. And when we look at behavioral engagement, when you the examples of the behaviors and actions like attend and participate in class activities, they complete assignments. Behavioral engagement really equates to compliance and compliance is not going to keep our students motivated. So we have to think about how do we design tasks that also taps into the cognitive engagement where students are really self monitoring, self assessing, they're planning on um, what they need to do for their next steps and really looking for and seeking out that challenge. We also need to design tasks that tap into the emotional engagement. So this is where we're piquing their curiosity about the content and really tapping into that social aspect of learning and relationships as students work collaboratively together. So all of these help to really build the level of engagement that students need in the distance learning or the face to face setting. In our text on page 104, it talked about the continuum of engagement and you can see on one end we have extreme active disengagement and on the other end we have that active engagement. And so when we look at the three areas of engagement, that's where we know we want kids to be. But when we look at participating, that is passive engagement. And again, when you read those descriptors, it links back to student compliance. What we want to do task for the distance learning setting that moves our students from participating to not only investing, but driving their own learning. And so when we go back to John Hattie's work, he offers these mind frames that really allow students to drive and own their own learning. And when you look at the first two, we see that they need to know their current level of understanding and know where they're going. Those both connect back to the importance of clarity that we talked about in module five. They also need to be able to select tools that can guide their learning and we need to really encourage them to seek feedback and to recognize that when they make mistakes that those are simply opportunities to learn. In addition to really own and drive their learning, we have to teach them to monitor their progress and know how to make adjustments along the way as well as recognize when they're learning and that ties back into the success criteria that we share with our students and ultimately this is all about them being able to teach others as they own that learning in module six it talks about when we are designing tasks that it is important that the purpose of the task determines the tool that the students will use not the other way around Sometimes we're busy searching for all these new um, innovative creative tools that we let the tools drive the task and that is not going to increase student motivation. We want them to be able to select the right tool based on the purpose of what the task is asking them to do. So to help with that in the text on page 105, the authors talked about the four functions of learning, finding information, using information, creating information and sharing information and that what we as teachers need to do is to find one tool that students could utilize to support each of those learning functions. So one tool for finding information, one for using information and so on. 
And this is incredibly helpful for not only us as teachers, but for students and their families as well. This is helpful for students and their families because they're only learning a minimal number of tools that they're going to utilize in the distance learning setting as they engage in different tasks. This is incredibly helpful for us as teachers because we can stop searching for all these tools, reading all these articles about here's this tool or here's this tool. We are going to pick one tool that is age appropriate for our students that aligns with each of these functions. And then our goal is to help them to use those tools flexibly between the face to face and the distance learning setting as they engage in different types of tasks. The text also offered some other considerations if we want to design tasks with engagement in mind. They suggest that move from giving students closed task to more of an open task where there are multiple entry points or students are looking at something from multiple perspectives. It suggests that we also move from information task to understanding task where students are actually taking information and demonstrating their understanding of it in different ways, whether that's through like a compare and a contrast or identifying rules and patterns or maybe even like developing a metaphor. They also suggest moving from a telling task, so telling students what they need, to more of an asking task where we allow students to try out their ideas to really get a sense of what works and what doesn't work. Let them do that first before we then give them more information. And then finally, it suggests moving from procedure task to problem solving task where students are working together in small groups and as they're working together, we give them a task where maybe they don't get all the information they need at first. They only get some of the steps or maybe we give them some irrelevant information so that they collaboratively are solving together to figure out what do we have? What do we need? What do we still need? Or what do we have that we don't even need? You can see each of these examples are tapping back into the behavioral, cognitive and emotional um, engagement that can really help motivate our students in the distance learning setting. And then finally in module six, it talked about the importance of being very intentional in communicating our academic expectations in a way that is useful for students, families and our colleagues. On page 118, it offered a template of a weekly planner. The author suggests that we help students see kind of a week at a glance so they can see what is expected of them for each week. And you can see front and center on here are the learning intentions and success criteria that really help to continually frame the purpose of everything the students are doing in a particular week. Then you can see on here that each day is divided into what students might attend, read, watch, discuss, and turn in. So things are going to do independently, small group, as well as whole group. And one of the things we did in designing the learning plan for this particular study is to try to mimic some of these elements within that and you'll see an example of that um, later in our um, slide deck today but this is just a second grade example of what a completed template might look like and again you can see at the top going back to what's the purpose the so students consistently see this is the, what you're learning this week and here's how you're going to know if you've learned it through those success criteria and then as it's broken down students clearly know each day what is expected of them this also helps families to support their students at home as they can see what it is the students are expected to do each day they can help monitor their students learning against those success criteria and can keep track of what it is students are supposed to turn in as it's clearly articulated in this example. In addition, this can help our colleagues. If we have students in our class that maybe have an IEP, a 504, maybe they um, are second language learners, then we can help the teachers who provide supports to them by also letting them see this weekly plan so they know exactly what supports their students might need to complete the different expectations of them throughout the week. So when we consider the highlights from module seven, we have to acknowledge the significant role that planning plays in distance learning. We know from our text that too much emphasis on teaching rather than learning results in lack of relevance for our students. They need strong instruction from strong teachers, but equally important is how we communicate the purpose or learning intentions to students throughout their learning. And so to communicate that purpose or 
for intention for learning, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry provide this graphic to help us visualize the distance learning instructional framework. The center of the pinwheel is the purpose or intention for learning, while the spinning parts of the pinwheel represent the components of the framework. So demonstrating and practicing, mostly occurring during asynchronous learning, and collaborating, coaching, and facilitating occurring mostly during synchronous learning. This pinwheel highlights the significant role that teacher clarity plays in students' learning, and it drives the instructional decisions that teachers make. When we consider the components of the instructional framework, demonstrating provides students with examples of what they will do or learn. It gives them a glimpse inside the mind of another person. Since thinking is invisible, the goal is really to make it visible through these strategies, direct instruction, think alouds, and worked examples, such as completed steps of a math equation, for example, are some of the ways in which you might model expectations for students and increase that clarity of explanation and clarity of examples. Page 125 through 131 of the text gives us some clear step-by-step -step guidelines for using each of these strategies with students. Students needs, need lots of time to practice and over-practice in order to begin to apply their learning. And we know from John Hattie's text, Visible Learning, that spaced practice is more effective than mass practice. By giving students continually spaced out and deliberate opportunities to practice content, we are able to observe change over time in student learning that is crucial to improving performance because it offers students and teachers the necessary feedback to inform next steps. This practice in turn increases that clarity of guided practices and clarity of assessment student learning that the text talks about. And so here you see an example from a second grade classroom which focuses on reading comprehension. The components boxed in red are crucial to success in the asynchronous setting. The read, watch, turn in, and family projects. Those are the demonstrating and practicing portions, portions of the pinwheel we shared earlier. These are the same components we've intentionally tried to weave into our asynchronous portions of the book study with you each month through stream posts, extended readings, classwork materials, and read and response. We know from our text in the meta-analyses from John Hattie's research that collaborating via classroom discussion has an effect size of 0.82. Many of the collaborative routines that have been proven effective in face-to-face -face environments have been adapted to work well in distance learning settings also, such as book clubs, text rendering, jigsaw, and reciprocal teaching. Our discussion roundtable activity from our November synchronous meeting was one example of a collaborative routine used in breakout rooms. These routines provide opportunities for students to engage in oral or written dialogue with their peers and prove to be effective as students interact with content, reflect on their own thinking, and are exposed to the varying perspectives of others. Pages 132 through 137 of your text really breaks down these routines step by step for you in greater detail. Coaching and facilitating ultimately boil down to scaffolding students and adapting instruction according to specific needs of learners. This is often done through questioning, prompting, and cueing. When questioning does not elicit the response teachers are looking for, students often need statements made by the teacher, prompts, to focus them on the cognitive and metacognitive processes needed to complete a learning task. Cues, on the other hand, shift a student's attention to help them work through confusing content. Cues can be visual, verbal, gestural, and environmental. Pointing to an overlooked number in an equation would be an example of a gestural cue. It's important to elicit a range of prompt and cue types to meet the various learning styles of the students in your classroom. For detailed examples of each prompt and cue type, be sure to check out pages 141 and 142 again in your text. And so here you see another example from a second grade classroom 
which again focuses in on reading comprehension, but this time you see the components boxed in red, which really are crucial to success in the synchronous setting. The attend, discuss, co-create, and collaborate. Those collaborating, coaching, and facilitating portions of the pinwheel we shared earlier. And these are the same key components we've intentionally tried to weave into our synchronous book study meeting with you each month through shared documents, tools, breakout room discussions, and our monthly meetings. And so those are the highlights for modules six and seven. Now let's take a look at that second success criteria. In the month of December, we will be focused on feedback and informative assessment in the distance learning setting, as well as ways to improve the schooling experience across all classroom settings. You can see that just like in previous months, we have the success criteria broken down by module. As mentioned in our last November synchronous meeting and stream post, we will be combining the two December synchronous sessions into one. We know that many of you will be gearing up for winter break and we wanted to be responsive to that and offer a time to hopefully suit the majority on Monday, December 15th from 4.30 to 5.45 p.m. And that's Eastern Standard Time. You'll notice on your reflect and respond column You'll choose one of the three questions or tasks there as well and think through a common question together. And then finally, for the extension resources this month, we have included an article from the Journal of Researcher, which discusses the five elements that impact quality feedback in the asynchronous classroom, an article from the National Center for Educational Outcomes, which this is on formative assessment strategies for students with disabilities, as well as links to the new Charlotte Danielson remote teaching framework documents. There you will find links to a teaching guide, self reflection or self assessment and reflection tool and observation tool. We know that many of you currently use the Danielson framework as an anchor to your beliefs and practices in your current schools or districts, and so we think that you'll find these resources particularly tied timely and relevant to our current state as we move in and out of remote learning. And finally, if you have any questions moving forward, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. Misty and I are happy to share any resources we have or clarify any of the information we've shared throughout the study. Thank you for watching and we hope that you found the content and resources from our fall books.